All right, hello, welcome. Um, this is, I'm Ben, and this is part six in a series where we implement a DSL for UI testing in Rust. Um, and this part is particularly exciting. Um, so what we're gonna start on today is the beginnings of an interpreter. And the goal for this video is by the end of the video, to be able to run a Schnauzer UI script against a web browser, um, we won't have we won't have like the automatic reporting or error handling or anything like that set up yet. But we will be able to run at least parts of um, Schnauzer UI scripts. So I'm excited. Let's get started. Um, we do need to add one more thing before we jump into the interpreter, which is that. We still haven't added the syntax for actually navigating to a web page. Um, so we're going to quickly add that to the scanner and the parser, and then we're going to get started on an interpreter and a sort of runtime environment. So let's do it. Okay, so what I've done as sort of a goal for this video is added some, added some content to the repository. So I've added a Selenium folder that contains uh, basically a standalone Selenium grid for us to run and register uh, browsers against, like web drivers against. Um, and then I've edited this script to be the script we want to run. Basically, um, this is the URL we're going to go to, and then we're going to run these three commands. Um, and then these will be run against this HTML, which we're going to be serving. So. Eventually, we're going to have a sort of um, an organized um, test suite where we can run one command and it will automatically serve the HTML for all the tests, and then it will run our scripts against them, um, and then it will generate a, report, a test report for us so that we can sort of um, author. We may write some actual like Rust unit and integration tests, um, but we definitely want to have some kind of like basically end-to-end -end tests where we're running Schnauzer UI scripts and making sure that they work as expected. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to serve this. Um, I'm basically just going to run a little Python HTTP server um, to serve this HTML on localhost. So I'm going to do that. And then if I go to localhost, one, two, three, four. You can see we have this directory listing because we're running it inside the uh, the test directory or the, the HTML directory. Um, and we have this HTML file. If we go there, you can see we have an HTML file to test. Um, this file is set up to test three specific things. So if, if you remember when we talked about the priorities for Schnauzer UI, we want to sort of we want to sort of move away from locating and testing elements based on their HTML, and we want to move toward um, locating and testing elements based on their visual attributes. So we're, we still have to use HTML, but rather than prioritizing things like IDs and names, um, the first things we want to be looking for is things that are visible to the user, so that when we author our tests, they're, they're based on things that are visible to the user, because that's actually really what we care about. We don't care if we can type into an element with a particular test ID. We care if we can type into the element that says username, right? So we're testing three things here. Um, we're going to locate this first input element by the label that's beside it. Um, and I've specifically not added a for attribute for that label. It's just beside it. Um, some frameworks do that, right? Some CSS frameworks are just not good about their, their HTML. Um, we want to we want to locate that username and be able to type into the input that's next to it, and then we're going to type into the password by its placeholder. Right? We can see it says password, so we should just look for password and type into it. Um, and then we want to locate and click this submit button. And basically, I've added a little JavaScript click event so that when we click it, it'll turn green. Yeah. So that's what we're going to be um, that's what we're going to be testing with. So let's start by adding um, adding the ability 
to actually visit this web page. So if we go into, let's close that out for a minute. Let's see, we have parser scanner. If we go into the scanner, um, we need to add one more command. And the command I'm going to add is called, we go to our test one, see, um, it's called URL. Um, we may change it later. I think URL is fine now. We might call it visit or go to or something like that. Um, for now, we're going to call it URL, and you should be able to simply give it a URL, um, and it will navigate the web driver to that page. So let's add that. So in the scanner, we need to add the URL token. So in commands, we have URL, right? And URL, well, the token itself doesn't have an associated value, but the command will, so we'll get there. So we have the URL command. And then let's fix our display URL. We call that URL. Okay, now let's scan it in. So down here in the scanner, if the thing we scan says URL, then we want to have a URL type token. Great. Okay, now let's go to the parser. Um, this is going to be a command statement, All right? So we, we want to try and parse a command. So here we have locate string token type report. All right? These are the commands that read to. These are the commands that take some input, and then down here, these are the commands that don't really take an input. So we just sort of have to um, issue them. So let's add a command that takes an input. else if self dot advance on and we want to we want to advance on a URL token right um, if that gives us back some URL token then the next thing we need to read in is a string literal or a variable for the um, for the URL, right? We can we can theoretically save save the URL as a variable, or we can just pass it directly to the command. So that's pretty much the same thing we do in all the other ones. So here in report, we have a message, a variable, and we can use either one. And then if we don't get a string literal or a variable, we say expected a variable or some text. We want to do pretty much the exact same thing. Let's call this URL, All right? Um, and we'll call this URL. And that should be it. Um, that we we've just parsed a um, we've parsed a um, URL statement. The only thing now is we have to make that a command. So instead of command report, we have to have a command called URL, which takes a command parameter. Right, and a command parameter can basically either be a variable to look up or it can be a string value. Um, and then down here, we'll get to the display later. When we when we parse this URL, instead of returning a report command, we want to return a URL command. And then we'll fix the display implementation. URL has a command parameter. We'll just write URL and the command parameter. 
Okay. What's your deal? Unused variable as token. Unused variable then token. We'll deal with these at a later date. Um, we don't use advance on any of anymore. I'm going to keep it for now. Um, I'm not going to do any refactoring right now. Um, now, let's run. So right now the way we have it set up is we scan and parse and then we print out the statements that we parsed. So let's run this for our current test and let's see if we parse the um, URL correctly. Of course, the one thing I did wrong was I need to pass it either a string literal or a variable. So I need to give it quotes around that. Okay. Let's... Ooh, what's your deal? Yeah, but let's call this... Test 1. Great, so it looks like we parsed the URL command correctly. So now we have all, we're parsing all the types of commands we need to run our script. Now we just need to execute them. So let's do it. I'm going to make something called interpreter.rs. Okay, let's add this to lib. mod interpreter and why are the use statements before the mod when they're local I feel like maybe cargo formats doing that let's find out but right so the mod statements are what bring the parser and the scanner into scope so it feels like they should happen before the use statements No, oh, yeah, okay, they were just they were just up there at the top. Okay, yeah. And then the, the way I usually like to do it, I don't know if uh, this is standard or not, I may get criticized for this, but I like to do um, third-party imports, um, local like module declarations, um, and then local imports. Um, okay, cool. So now, rather than printing out the statements, what we want to do is we want to basically be able to construct some interpreter, right? Say let interpreter equal interpreter new, right? And then we'll want to interpreter dot interpret um, our statements. That's pretty much what we want to do. So let's make it happen. Let's have a pub struct interpreter. Great. And let's impl interpreter. Um, first thing we need is a new function. function new. Um, I don't know what plugin I'm using that's like looking ahead, um, but I could probably, I should probably report some kind of, not exactly a bug report, um, just report somewhere and say, hey, don't um, don't suggest the actual type name within these um, within an impl block. Suggest the keyword self. Um, yeah. And that's going to return self. Cool. Okay. So now we need to import this. And now we need interpreter to have an interpret method. Function interpret, which is actually going to take a mutable reference to self. And 
and um, the statements to run, which is going to be a vec type statements. And eventually this will return a result. So we're, what we're actually going to end up doing is um, we're going to have two classes of, of error. Um, and we'll get more into this when we do sort of an error handling video. Um, we're going to have static errors. And those are errors that we catch um, while we're scanning or while we're parsing. Um, and then we're going to have runtime errors. Uh, those are errors that happen while we're trying to run the provided um, syntax tree. So eventually this will return I don't know that it will return a result. It may take, um, this method may end up taking a reference to an error reporter um, interface of some kind. Um, but so somehow this method is going to communicate that there was an issue. But for now, now we're not going to, um, we're not going to return anything. Okay, let's bring statement into scope. Okay, and in lib, cannot borrow interpreter is mutable. Right, it needs to take a mutable reference to itself, so itself has to be it has to be mutable. Okay, so that's happening. Um, now we need we need to do a setup. So um, I think what we're going to do for now is we're basically just going to assume that we have um, a Selenium uh, standalone grid running on port 444. Um, 4444. There we go. Um, and then we will add, and then um, later on we'll probably use uh, something like clap, and we'll, we'll basically add a CLI that allows you to specify the Selenium grid you're running against. Um, and then we'll get even more creative with it because we want people to be able to parallelize, parallelize the, um, these scripts the same way they do with Selenium, right? Um, but for now, we're just going to assume that it's running on port 444. So we have this hosted. We have our test HTML hosted. Now, let's cd into Selenium. And then you can see we have this standalone grid. So I'm going to Java jar Selenium. And it should default to, ooh, what's your deal? Jar command name. Uh, we have to give it the command standalone. OK. They changed. Uh, so the version three didn't have this, but version four has this now. Standalone. And there we go. So we have a um, now we have a Selenium grid running on port four 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 four. So now let's add another terminal. Now we should be able to register a driver against it. So as part of the new function, um, we're going to have, hmm, I think what I want is, um, instead of having like one big interpreter struct, I think what I'm gonna end up wanting to do when we sort of parallelize things, um, is to basically have a copy of the interpreter for each script. So each interpreter will just sort of have its own web driver to work with. So let's do that. Let's give the interpreter a web driver. And we are finally using the 34 crate. OK, so you have your own web driver. Great. Let's make the web driver. So if we go to the documentation for 34, we can really just go to the sort of 
Crates.io example. Um, this is how you make a new web driver. Um, you give it your desired capabilities, and then you register it against your um, running processes. Process. Let's do this. Um, so this is actually going to be um, async. We can use. There is a there's a, um, a synchronous version of this crate, so we could use. 34 sync, right? But I don't think we're looking for maintainer. Cause it to diverge from the synchronous version. Yeah, that's kind of what I was worried about. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to use the async version. Do this. I am actually going to run these on Firefox. So let me import desired capabilities. Or really, um, actually, let's use the Prelude. Yeah, there we go. Great. Um, I'm actually going to run these on Firefox. Um, and our Selenium grid is running on port 444. And then this is going to be an async function new. Okay. So now we need uh, okay, and this could also, the interpreter could also fail Constructing the interpreter could also fail because it needs to have a web driver. So let's do a web driver result self. Yeah. And then driver. And we'll wrap this up in an OK. Great. OK, so now what we have to do is we have to come to lib. And we have to make this async, make this function async. And we'll do interpreter new dot await. Um, and we're going to have it return a web driver results, just a tuple. Um, and down here we'll do, okay. Uh, yeah, and then in our bin, this is where we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do the Tokyo main annotation here. We're going to ooh. We need Tokyo. Great. Quick fix, quick fix import. I think it's just to use Tokyo. It should be. I shouldn't even have to import it. What's your problem? Hmm. Got Tokyo thirty four. Let's see if we can get Rust Analyzer to catch up by taking it off and then putting it down again. Great. Okay. Um, oh, Rust Analyzer is still running. It still might get. It still might get mad. But async. Aha. Great. 
let dot await dot expect. Oh no! Right, and obviously we're going to clean all this up at a later date. But now we should be registering a web driver against the running Selenium grid. So let's see if that pops up a web driver. So I've got Firefox open. Let's let's run the script. Just got to compile Tokyo. running. We'll see if another Firefox. Okay. Oh no. Oh, Firefox is updating. That happens sometimes when you um, when you run your um, web driver against Firefox. Firefox will update. See, and then it, it, it launched. But it was just, the error was because Firefox was like, no, let me update first. So let's do this again. Yeah, and there's our there's our browser. Great, we launched a browser. Okay, let's start interpreting statements. Um, let's do yeah, what the heck? Four statements in. Statements dot let's do into iter. Now I was thinking about this earlier. Um, eventually we're gonna have um, we're going to save the previously run statements um, as part of like as a field on the interpreter and we're so that we can sort of time travel backwards um, when we have an error because we have this concept of a try again um, but for now we're just going to run the sh statement straight through but eventually we're going to sort of store the statement we're running so that we can run it again if we have to okay let's match on statement no code actually available there we go um, give me one moment here, actually, I'll pause. Sorry about that. Just a few things to take care of. Okay, where were we? Um, we lost a driver. We're iterating over the statements, and we want to know how to execute them. Okay, um, let's do... Do we have anything other than command statements? I think for our test script, that's a command statement. That's a command statement, that's a command statement, and that's a command statement. So to get the initial script up and running, we just have to run command statements. Okay. Let's do command statement, command statement. And let's match on the command statement, shall we? Oh, come on. You can see that there's a missing arm. We have command statement. And what are our... Ooh. Okay, so command statement is... Oh, we can't match on it because... Um, it's a struct. That was silly. Let's destructure it. Let's command statement equal CS, and we'll say 
what are the parts of a command statement? We have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. Left-hand side and the right-hand side. Left-hand side is a command, and the right-hand side has um, an option for, or has a, is optional, and then it has the token, um, okay, rather, we won't do this destructuring. Let's do, first we want to execute the single command, so let's do a function called execute command, and we'll give it the left hand side to execute. Right? Um, and we'll say dot await. Right? That's probably going to be we might as well go ahead and propagate errors to um, let's do Let's do a function called execute command statement. Take CS. And we'll make a function. That takes the command statement. I guess we'll call it CS. Command statement. And it's going to return a web driver result. Let's do we're deciding right now um, basically we're going to execute a bunch of Selenium commands. Um, and those commands can fail. And when they fail, they're going to return a web driver error. And what I'm, the reason I'm pausing here is I'm trying to decide where I want to turn that web driver error into um, some kind of custom error. Um, and I think right now I don't I don't care. Let's just get it running. So let's run a web driver results. Yeah. Okay. So to execute this command statement, first we need to execute the command on the left hand side. So we'll say self dot execute command. Um, and that's going to take the left hand side. And this is going to be an async function as well. So let's call this dot await. This is going to be an async function. Great. And then in lib, when we call interpret, we're going to call dot await. Okay, so we want to execute the left-hand side. And then if, let's say if let sum, and the option is this tuple with a token, and then the right-hand side statement equals cs dot right-hand side. Right, so this is a box command statement. Then we want to self dot execute command statement. Yeah, it's going to be recursive. 
on CS dot right hand side. But we only do that if um, the command on the left hand side evaluated to true, right? So we're going to say let results equal self dot execute command, and this is probably going to be dot await. I'm actually not going to have that return. Yeah, I'm going to lower the error handling down quite a bit, actually. This is going to not return a result at all. Um, and we're going to have execute command do the error handling. If let's um, right hand side, equal right hand side, and and statements are um, I think they told us not to do that right if I do and results it's going to say something like yeah let expressions in this position are unstable so we'll just wrap this in an if result if let's um, then we want to recursively execute the command statement on the right hand side. Great. Let's write a function called, oh, and we need to um, dereference that. Option token, oh, we need to not cs dot right hand side, right hand side. There we go. Okay, now we need a function called execute command. So what this does basically is when it gets a command statement, um, remember a command statement is sort of like this recursive structure that can have commands chained on the right hand side via an, an AND token. So what we do is we, um, we execute the command on the left hand side and that should evaluate to a boolean um, to tell us whether or not the command was errored out basically. Um, if it was successful, meaning it returned true, then what we're going to do is we're going to, going to pull the right hand side command statement out and recursively execute that. Um, so now let's make a pub async function. I know they're all pub. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll probably have a whole video where we go through um, sort of standardizing what we want our API to be for other people to use this. Um, let's do execute command. You're going to take an and mute self, and you're going to take the command, which is a yeah commands, and you're going to return a boolean. So what we're going to do is we're going to execute the command. Um, and then we're going to do error handling on it as a sort of side effect on, um, on an error reporter that we store in the interpreter um, or that gets passed to the interpreter. I haven't really decided yet. Um, and then we'll sort of downgrade that after we've handled the error by reporting it, um, we'll downgrade that error to a Boolean result. So let's match the command. What kind of command are we executing here? Okay, locate, type, click, report, fresh, try again, screenshot, had error, read to your, okay. So we only need to implement um, a few of these to get our script running. We need to implement the, let's do the URL command first. Takes a URL and let's do self dot URL command. That takes, um, yeah, I guess we'll just have that um, method return a boolean. And that's going to take a string. So it would just say create the method. Okay. Pub async function URL command. And it takes um, the URL as a string and returns boolean for whether or not it succeeded right so now finally 
we're going to do the selenium for this command. And so, no method names, what's your deal? Oh, it needs to take it. Uh, needs to take itself. Great. Expected struct string found command param. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Um, so remember, the parameter we pass to a um, to a command um, can be one of two. Th it's an enum, and it can be one of two things. It can be either a variable that we need to resolve, um, or it can be a um, resolve is a technical word. A, 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 a variable that we need to get the value for, um, or it can be just some text that we want to actually do. So let's do, let's have this take a command param, right? Okay, and then let's match URL. Ooh, love it. Okay, so if we got, we're not going to implement the variable side yet. Um, we're just going to implement the string part. So what do we want to do with this string? Well, we want to take the web driver and we want to go to, right? So the go to method, that's where you give it the URL. And we want to go to that URL. So we'll give it the string, and then we'll dot await, and then we'll, um, instead of propagating the error, we're just going to return, we're going to say is OK. Right, so if, um, we'll deal with proper error handling later, um, but if the, um, if the result, if the sort of web driver result of this command is an okay value, then we're going to say true, it worked. Um, and if it fails, then we're going to say false, it didn't work. Um, we will add a step in there to sort of uh, map up, map on the error and um, do our little side effect error handling. But right now we're going to ignore the error. Um, this needs to be awaited. This future needs to be awaited. Great. Recursion in an async function requires boxing. Okay. Um, so this function is asynchronous and we are calling it recursively. So it's saying recursion in an async function requires boxing a recursive async function. It must be rewritten to, redur to return a boxed din future. And then it says, consider using the async recursion crate, which I assume is gonna be some sort of, um, I, think, I, I think I've actually used this before. It's just like a derive um, recursive, um, async function. So basically, instead of having to type out like the box in future plus send plus sync and all that, um, we can just add a little macro on top. And that'll make it much easier to read our code. So let's go to this crate. It won't let me copy from there. Will you let me copy from in here? Great. Let's visit this crate. Oh, yeah, we can do it from here. Async recursion. Yeah, so you add, you, you bring it in, and then you add async recursion to the top of your function. Awesome. Um, let's just use cargo add. Great. And then let's add this. Add the use statement. And then 
We'll add the attribute on the recursive async method. Awesome. And so that is theoretically runnable, is it not? Let's try it. Um, so we have this test. What I'm going to do is I'm going to comment out the rest of the commands. Um, and let's see if it navigates to the test page. a second browser and it navigated to um, localhost look at that it navigated to the page sweet so we've just executed um, schnauzer UI code that is freaking awesome okay um, we want to go to the test one so let's actually make this the URL we navigate to and then we'll get started on the next part that is fan flip um, Now we need the locate command um, and the type command. So let's go into the interpreter um, and let's add the locate command. So locate. Um, before I do that, um, let's go ahead and sh ec extract this. Um, we are very, we are going to constantly be um, trying to turn a command, trying to downgrade a command parameter in, into just a string. So what we probably want is a utility function um, that takes a command parameter and resolves it to a string for us, either by unwrapping the string value or um, looking up the variable in, in our environment, when we have an environment. So let's write a little utility function pub function, um, we'll call it resolve. I don't know, resolving is a technical word and I don't know that I'm using it correctly here, but when, I, when I'm saying resolve, I'm, I'm saying take the command param and downgrade it to a string however you need to. Resolve, and we'll just take command param, um, which is a command param, and that's going to return. Um, that's got to return a result because um, for right now we're just unwrapping a string, um, but in the future it could look up a variable that hasn't been defined, and so it will need to um, will need to propagate an error when that happens. So we're going to say result string empty tuple. Okay, and let's do basically this. We want to match the command param. Uh, you need to take a self, self. Actually, you don't need a self. You're an associated function. Oh well, you it will need it will need that because it has to look up um, it has to look up variables, but it probably won't need mutable access. So let's go with that, um, and let's put this back where it belongs, which is there. And then let's say if it's a string, return the string, and then we won't implement the. We won't implement the variable side of things yet, right? Great. And so we'll say, let's um, let URL equal. Um, we'll say if let okay URL equals self dot resolve and we give it the URL 
command param. Basically, if we get if we successfully get a URL back, then we want to navigate to that URL and return whether or not that was successful. Otherwise, we would end up handling the um, undefined variable error and then we would return false, right? So that should still run the same. driver yeah and we we navigated to the test page great okay now uh, we need to implement locate so locate is going to take um, a locator and that's going to be a command param and basically we can call self dot locate and we'll give it the locator and call dot await. Okay, now we need a locate method. So pub async function locate and that's going to take a mutable reference to self and um, the locator which is a command parameter and we want that to return a boolean right we want it to sort of resolve to a boolean so that um, we know whether or not to keep going and then we need to resolve our uh, Really, I'm going to rewrite this really quickly because the way I'm actually going to end up doing it is I'm going to say let well I guess that's fine I guess that's fine I'd like to do it in two straight lines and do some kind of early return but we'll see we'll see okay let's do the same thing down here if let's OK locator will self dot resolve locator, right? That should unwrap um, the command parameter to a string for us. If we don't find it, we're going to do the same thing, right? We want to handle the undefined variable error. And then. Let's do. We might even handle that error in the resolve method. Um, let's do. Okay. We what we need to do now is we need to execute the correct queries to locate our web element. Um, but we have a pretty complex method for doing that. Um, the first thing we need to do is we need to add a field on the interpreter for the current web element that we're considering. Um, because basically, um, the, the way that this, basically the way that our script is gonna work is when we call a locate command, it's gonna sort of focus on the element we're trying to locate. And then any subsequent commands we type are um, directed at that element until such time as we locate a different element. So let's add let's add a current element and this has to be an option because we can't start with an element in view. We'll call that option web element right? 
and then we'll start it with current element as none. Great, and then now let's locate our web element. So we have um, we have an interesting um, precedence here. Um, basically, um, we, we decided we were going to focus on, it's this little blue thing here, we decided we were going to focus on human readable values first and then, then go to HTML as sort of a secondary idea. So we want to start with the text of the element. We want to look for an element just by the text in it. We think that's the first thing we want to look for. We want to look for um, any placeholder attribute or an adjacent label with the correct text. Um, really a preceding label in, in terms of where it shows up in the HTML. Um, because when we're typing into an input, those are the two things we use to specify to the human being looking at the page what they should type into. Either it has some sort of label or it has some sort of placeholder. And then we want to go ID, name, title, and finally XPath. So let's start doing those queries. So let's try to find the element by its text. So let's do let element equals self dot driver dot do I want to do um, I'm going to use I'm going to use 34's query interface so it has this sort of high level query and we're going to say by text locator do that and we're going to say find the I could say first is there an only method hmm. let's do we'll do first so it has these um, the query interface has these two methods it has first so that you can query for the first element that matches your query or it has all, so you can query for all elements that match your query. Um, I kind of wish it had an only method, right? Say like this, we should find this element and it should be the only method. I guess we could we could do that ourselves. Um, we could find all and then um, we could verify that the that the list of the um, the list has a length of one. There we go. Um, but uh, for now, we're just going to do first. Say, find the first element that uh, goes with that. And then let's wait. And then, yeah. So that's element. So that's going to be a result um, with a web. Yeah, that's going to be a web driver result web element. So we're going to say, if let, OK, element. But okay, found elements equals Elm, or really, let's do it this way. Right, so if this query is successful and finds the element we're looking for, um, then we want to set self dot current element to found element, right? We want to say that's expected. Oh, we have to wrap it up in a sum. Right? Um, we want to set the current element to that element. And then we're probably going to want some tracker at the beginning, like let's located equal false, let mute located equal false, um, and here we're going to say located equals true. 
and then we'll do the next query. So after finding an element by its text, are you not a... Let's go look at the documentation for locating web elements. So if we look at 34 docs and then we have the by struct, it has the command by I want this we on 34 go home structs hmm chain, common components. Query. Common query. By, there it is. Command by. Okay, so we have ID, link text, CSS, XPath, name, tag, class name, locator. What is that? That's interesting. Okay, so these are what we can locate by. Um, and I think what I want to do is sort of locate by exact text, and I'm just going to do that with an XPath. Yeah, the other option is like. Yeah, because we'd have to actually locate an element before we could check the text on it. Just trying to think if there's a better way. No, I think that's what we're going to do. Okay. So let's do by XPath. And then we're going to do format. And we're going to search for any element such that the text is exactly um, the locator text. We could do, what's your deal? Um, oh, and let's do lo return located down here. So what that's going to do is that's going to look for any element such that the text is exactly the provided text. Um, we could have it look for we could have it look for a partial text match, but I'd be worried that you know with fields with lots of forms that might cause problems. Maybe we'll put a partial text match somewhere in the hierarchy, right? So do like look for exact text, then look for a placeholder or an input, um, or look for a placeholder on the input, or look for some label text, and then maybe do the same do the same search but with partial text if we don't find the complete text. That might be that might be a way to go. Yeah, we'll go with exact text for now. Let's just get it done. Okay, so we're locating an element by its text. The next thing we want to do is we want to locate um, an element by its... Um, probably want to do placeholder next. To placeholder. So, really, once we've located the element, we should return. So let's actually, rather than keeping track of whether we located an element, let's put false here. 
to say, hey, we reached the end of our queries and we never found the element. And instead, let's return true here. Yeah. Okay. Now let's try and locate an element by its placeholder. Um, and now we don't have to check whether or not we found the element last time because we know it would have exited earlier. If let, okay, found element, um, we want to look for, let's do an XPath again. Um, and this time, we want the placeholder attribute to equal the provided locator. So I think that's going to be at placeholder should do the trick. Um, and if, if you have a placeholder attribute, that should always be an input element. We are going to run into... Um, are going to run into fun times when people don't use HTML forms properly, but that's what the, the default to XPath is for. So we could say this is where we're specifically looking for an input um, that where the placeholder is the provided locator. What's your problem? Uh, capital P. Yeah, so if we do that, and then we'll do this exact same thing. Okay, that's placeholder. Now let's look for um, locate an element by its locate an element by um, locate an input element by a preceding label. So this one's going to be fun. So what we want to do is we want to do exactly this. But we want to find um, a label element such that the text of that label is equal to what we're looking for. Um, and then we want to find the, um, the input element that follows it, right? Yeah? I think that's what we want to do. So we can look for an element by its text. We can look for an element by its placeholder and we can look for an input element by a preceding label. Um, there's one more thing I want to do, which is that this query, um, really all these queries, they have a, I think the default weight is 60 seconds. Um, we can override the weight. And I think what I want to do, eventually we'll have some sort of, um, we'll have like a, a a polling mechanism so we want to do like a no wait query for all of the elements and then we want to maybe wait one second um, or you know maybe wait five seconds for the first query and then nothing for the rest of them I think to start out we'll do a full-on we'll do a full-on 60 second query for the first one it's gonna be slow uh, but we'll, we'll fix it later We'll do a full-on query for this one, and then both of these will be no wait queries. So we'll say dot no wait because we've already, if we've gotten here, we've already waited 60 seconds. So we don't really want to be waiting on these ones too. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll come up with a sort of looping mechanism for increasing that weight. Well, I mean, let's do it now, right? Why not? Let's say for the 
zero to ten. Right? Uh, what's what's uh, for weight in zero to ten? Uh, actually, let's do this as I just do zero. Five, ten, thirty. I do that. Wait to I thirty-two. Great. Um. Then we'll say let's do these. And what we want to do is the first wait. Forced to wait for the specified timeout. Override the polar. Okay, so I get that. So force this element query to wait for the specified timeout, polling once after each interval. Let's look at the docs on that. Um, I don't necessarily want to do some kind of override let's let's look at query this is query and we have this element query first no wait forces this element query to not wait for the specified conditions and then we have return only a single web element hey look at that Let's replace these with single. Um, I think the reason we want to do that is um, if someone provides some text and we find two elements that have that text, we want to know which one they're talking about um, rather than just run the first one. We might change that decision. Um, OK. Let's look at, wait, forces this element query to wait for the specified timeout, pulling once after each interval. This, okay, so the interval is the, is the polling interval. Um, let's do the timeout as wait, and let's just do the polling interval as uh, these need to be durations. So let's make this a duration from sex weight. And let's make this a duration from sex um, one. We're going to have a one second poll. And then let's start this. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. OK, so now we have a locate command. Um, now we need a type command. So let's add that. What time are we at? 114. OK, we're, we're doing good. We're doing good. Um, this, yeah, we don't need that anymore. Let's add a type command. So we have self.locate, self.type, and type should take some, um, I mean, it's not necessarily, yeah, we'll, we'll say it's going to take some text, right? Um, and let's say self.type, I'm sorry, self. We can't use the keyword type, so we'll say self dot um, type into element, and then we'll give it the text as a command parameter, and then we'll call dot await. We'll add a comma. Great. 
now let's add a function. Type into element. And that's going to take a mute self and the command parameter and it's going to return a boolean. Right? Okay. So if let some current elements equal self dot current element, then we're going to type into it. Um, if there is no current element, then this is going to be um, no elements located error. This is part of why we don't have sort of a custom error um, st structure set up yet. Um, I knew that we would be discovering tons of sort of error types as we went along. Um, and I figured we would sort of just stringify those for a while. And then once we got to a, you know, a solid place in terms of our functionality, we could try to um, go through the code and enumerate those into specific error types. Um, but for right now, we're not even throwing an error, so we're going to say false just to let it know that this didn't work. Um, and then, okay, so we've got the current element. And now what we want to do is we want to let the text equal self dot resolve command param dot await. Um, what did I do before with this? I did an if let statement. Okay. We'll do if let okay text equals self dot resolve command parameter. Wait, uh, it's not it's not async. Else and this is a this is a variable not defined error. Again, we're going to be cleaning this up. So this sort of like nested if else nonsense, we'll do we'll do lots of refactoring on this after we get it working. Um, so that's going to return a false, and then let's. Um, current element dot type, uh, I think it's going to be send keys. Yeah, send keys. And then we'll give it the text, and then we'll dot await, and then we'll return whether or not that operation was successful. Um, cannot move out of current element, which is behind a mutable reference. Okay, so current element is a web element. Can we ant it? Can we get a reference to it? Yeah. And web element? Cool. Great. Um, weirdly enough, I don't think I need, yeah, I don't need a mutable reference to the web element to send keys. Um, there's, there's a reason behind that. Um, I don't know what it is, but there's a, um, the API is sort of designed this way. You, in general, you don't need um, a mutable reference to the web driver to do something to it. You can just basically just use a plain old reference. Um, but yeah, so theoretically, that should type some keys, shouldn't it? So let's type some keys. Um, let's locate username and type test at test.com. So this one is the one that's going to locate by the preceding label. So let's see if that works.
We are running. It's going to take a second to register the web driver. There we go. Navigate to the test. It quit running. Okay. So why didn't it find you? So what we're looking for here is um, we have this label, right? And it's it precedes this input that we're trying to type into. I've added a bunch of um, attributes to these because we're going to be you know going through the different kinds of locators. Um, but right now, the way we're trying to locate this is we're trying to say there's a label and uh, before this input, and the label's text is username. Yeah, so we have the locate username with a capital U and type test at test.com. Let's verify our XPath on this. So if we go to the interpreter, we are trying to locate the element by this XPath. So let's verify that that XPath actually finds the, oh, sorry, it's this one. Um, locate an element by a preceding label. So let's verify that this XPath actually finds the input we're looking for. Um, and instead of text, it's going to be username. So that found two elements. It found that one and it found that one. Right. And it's looking for only a single web element so it would have failed. So we have to do first on this one. So this we're going to want to do first. There's all sorts of these. The way we want to query by default we're going to have to think through over and over and over again. Okay. So let's see if that types in for us. So we open up, find the test, and it quit running and it didn't type. Hmm. Interesting. So that X path should have found our labels. Let's print. Let's let's label locator equal let's have this right let's say and label locator and we'll say println trying to locate element by and then we'll give it the label locator, right? The idea is if we get to the point where we're trying to execute this query it should print out um, what we're doing. Listen, I'm aware that um, I'm debugging with print statements, just, just let me be, just let me be. Okay, here we go. This one's running. Okay, it quit before executing, didn't it? It quit before executing. So what's going on? So we have this function locate. Are we calling the locate function? in the locate 
function. Woohoo! Great. Let me close all these browsers. We've got this sort of here, right? Okay, so we made it to the locate function. So why, oh why, don't you want to print? So if we resolve the locator. So let's add print line. Successfully resolved locator. And let's, while we're here, let's add a few more of these lovely print statements. Um, we should print this if we get past it, right? Let's do that. We successfully resolved the locator. So we're in there. Great. But we're not so four weight in there. So we're first trying to find an element where the text. Oh, okay, here we go. Here's <laughs> where we're running into trouble. Um, gosh, that was silly. Okay, so there is an element where the text equals exactly, um, exactly um, what we're looking for, and that's the label. So we're basically trying to type on the label first rather than type into the um, adjacent input. So, how do we want to handle this? Um, we can change the precedence. Um, you almost never want to interact with a label. Um, rather, you, if, if you're looking for the label, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to type into the field. So I think we could probably just do this. We'll just put text after the placeholder and um, label. Yeah, let's go with that. Hey, because I don't think it's going to cause problems the other way around. Um, I don't think you're going to be looking for an element with the text of a placeholder and then accidentally find the placeholder instead. You know what I mean? Check it out. We typed um, test at test.com. We successfully located the field um, based on the fact that it had a preceding label. Awesome. Right, so all, all the manual tester has to do is see the label username and say look for that and it will know to go to the um, go to the adjacent input. Great. Awesome. Okay. Let's get rid of this print statement. Um, and then 
in our test, now that we know that that's working, let's try and locate an element by its placeholder. Let's see if that works too. And this will also test, um, I guess our we know that our AND functionality is working as well, right? Because once it located username, it typed test at test.com. So we know that that's working too. There we go. We typed, uh, that's a password, that's a password element, so you can't, um, right, that's a, that's an input with a, with a type password, so that's why it's covering up what we typed. Um, but we typed in, I think it was password one, two, three. Yeah. Awesome. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to change that. Uh, in our test HTML, let's stop serving for a minute um, and let's change it from a type password to just a type text so that you can, um, sorry, text, so that you can see what it is we've typed in. Um, and now let's serve this again. Great, so we have our test running. All right, and let's run this. Check that out. We typed in the username based on the fact that um, the label for the input was username. We typed in the password based on the fact that the placeholder for the password input field was uh, password. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna click this button. And um, just for testing purposes, I've added a little um, event listener so that when you click this button, it turns green. So let's do clicking the button. God, it feels so good to have it running. Okay. Let's see here. Um, we need to, we have locate, um, and locate should locate by text if it doesn't do the field options. Um, we just need to implement the click command. So if we go to our interpreter, if we go to the commands, we have click. And let's do self dot click dot point. Um, we could do this in line probably, but we might as well have a might as well stay organized. Pub function click. That's going to take a mutable reference to self, um, and the command takes no input. Right, we don't have to resolve anything. Um, and it's going to return a boolean for whether or not um, the operation succeeded. And then this is going to be an async function. Great. Okay. Um, we're going to implement this click. Okay, so Selenium has a concept of clicking an element. Um, there are about a thousand different ways to click an element. and. Um, what I think I want to do is the most general one. So there's this idea of a JavaScript click. Um, you can execute the click using JavaScript. Um, sometimes we you end up using that in Selenium because the regular click is reg registering some sort of error you don't think should be going on, and the JavaScript click kind of works around it. Um, especially if you get like click intercepted errors that aren't real. Um, there's like a there's HTML maybe covering, but it's not visibly covered. It should be clickable by the user. Um, so we're not going to do that. I also don't think we're going to do the regular Selenium click um, because sometimes you get these weird click intercepted errors. At least for me, um, um, I've been working on uh, you know a lot of Angular um, websites, um, and for whatever reason, um, in Selenium, when you try to click on certain Angular elements, I don't know if it's the, um, some sort of third-party UI library or what, um, but you get these really nonsensical um, click-intercepted elements. So what I think I want to do 
um, for the click is instead I'm going to get the coordinates on the uh, get the coordinates of the web element um, on the web page and then register the click there. That actually reminds me I want to do one more thing with the locate command. Um, in the locate command I also want to scroll the web element into view. So let's do that and then let's do our sort of awkward click on top click and then we should be good to go. So in the locate command once we've located the web element then we want to scroll the web elements into view because presumably we're about to interact with it right um, and you almost never want to try to in, you never want to try interacting with an element that's not in view it's just it doesn't make sense for testing requirements um, okay so let's do that self dot um, we'll say if let's sum um, current element equals self dot current element right because remember this function can um, this function can return without having ever located an element um, in which case we we don't have an element to locate in a view and we don't want to cause an error based on that so we're just saying if we did find some some element uh, oh and we need to borrow this if we did find some element, we should be able to say current elements dot scroll into view. Create dot await dot. Um, this could fail, and I think we want that to be an error. So we'll actually return the is okay there, and then we'll just say else. That means no element. Well, we'll do a return statement like we did before. We might have to come refact this. I try to stick to um, try to stick to functions that resolve to an expression instead of these return statements because they just tend to make more sense when you read them. Okay, so if we get some current element, um, then we need to scroll it into view. What is your pro oh? Now we need to implement click. Um, let's do if let some current elements for and self dot current element um, else. If we call click and we don't have a located element, um, that's going to be an error. So error for no element located. Right, we don't just want to call click right away. Um, that may actually be something, presumably if a locate element request fails, um, then we should um, if a, if a locate request fails, then it will go to the error handler, right? So we're never we're never going to call click um, when there's no located element unless somebody types the click command before they type the locate command. Um, so that's actually something that we could upgrade. We won't do it now. There's something that we could upgrade to a static error. Um, right, we could do either as part of um, parsing or as a separate pass. We could say, hey, if we find a click command before a locate command was registered, um, then that's an error. Um, and we don't even need to run to know that that's an error. So, something to think about. Um, but we'll say return false. And then if we do find an element, then we want to perform a click, right? Current element. Um, but we don't want to 
um, we don't want to do the regular click. We want to sort of click on top of it. So let's say an element dot. Can you give me the yeah focus handle? We could do it on the session handle. It's clickable. It's displayed. It's done. It's like the outer prop query rect. Yeah, so rect should give us the um, the coordinates to it, but I think there might be wait until to uh, all right, yeah. Let's do um, let's do rect, right? And rect is going to return this element rect. Right? And we'll say dot. Okay, so now we. This is something that we await. And then we basically want to propagate this, right? We want to say if this is an error, then we want to return the bool. We can't use question mark because it'll try to propagate an actual error. Um, yeah, we'll just have to do the sort of ugly nested um, if statements right now, and then when we come back, we'll make it a lot cleaner. So we'll say if let OK coordinates equal that. And then else, this is going to be an error, we'll call false. Okay, so now we have the element rect. And I think this has like a, this has a method on it maybe where I can click it. So we have center, I center. I center gives you I sixty four. Yeah, I think um, eventually what we're going to do is this. We're going to do um, self dot driver dot click. Well. Uh, action. It's going to be an action chain. Action chain. Dot. Yeah, we want to move to. Oh, hey, th this is the shortcut I was looking for. So we can move to the element center um, and then perform the click. So let's actually do this. Let's get rid of all this. Okay, so we can start an action chain. We can say move to the element center, and we can give it the current element as the element to move to the center of, right? And then we can call click, and then we can call await, and then we can return, uh, oh, I'm sorry, click, and then we need perform dot await dot is okay. Yeah? Yeah, so the idea here is um, rather than try to click the element is itself, we don't really want to worry about um, like click intercepted or anything like that. Um, if we fail to click something we're supposed to click, we'll just let that error show up a little later um, when the, you know, whatever the, whatever the semantic value of that um, comes to bite us. Um, but really, we just want to find where the element is, and we'll just register a click at that place on the web driver. And if something's covering it, something's covering it, and that's a failing test, and that'll show up later when what we expected to happen didn't happen, right? Um, so let's run that and see if it clicks our web element.
So we should get... Okay, so it typed, typed in the fields, but it didn't click the web element. I wonder why. So let's see what happened, right? Because if we register a click on top, it should do that. Oh, I know why. We didn't uncomment the command. Let's see this time if it does. There we go. All right, so we typed into um, the username field based on the adjacent label. We typed into the password field based on the placeholder, and we were able to click the submit button based on the text of the button. And we know that it clicked submit because um, the button turned green. So that's it for this video. Congratulations. We have a working programming language. Um, for a, a working, we have a working DSL for testing UIs. Um, I will see you in the next video when we flesh out the interpreter and implement more commands. See you then.